Justice Department calls it one of the greatest threats to our country, cybercrime. And just as the FBI began looking into one of the biggest cyber thefts ever by a Russian crime ring, we learned today of another break-in, this time involving a company that does background checks for federal employees and contractors. Jeff Pegues is in Washington. He's been looking into all of this. Jeff? Scott, late this afternoon, the FBI said that it is investigating a cyber attack on USIS. That is the company that does background checks on federal employees, meaning that the personal and financial information of thousands of government workers could now be at risk. The federal government has suspended most background checks until investigators can assess the damage. The revelation comes on the heels of a separate report that said a Russian gang stole the largest known amount of personal data on the internet ever. Security analysts are concerned the Russian crime ring behind the theft could ultimately sell the stolen personal data, exposing bank accounts and leading to identity theft. The report by the private firm Hold Security says that a dozen Russian hackers broke into at least 420,000 websites and stole over 1 billion usernames, passwords, and email addresses. Hold says some of the information was stolen from Fortune 500 companies. Jim Lewis studies cybercrime and has worked with the military, government, and private industry. 420,000 websites, big and small. Yep. What does that tell you? What it tells me is that the hackers found a vulnerability in a program, and then they crawled around on the internet looking for places using that database software, found them and took everything out. Cybercrime is a growing threat to the global economy. A June report pegs its cost at more than $400 billion a year. At this command center for the security firm Mandiant, technicians constantly monitor internet activity, looking for cyber attacks. Even Jim Lewis admits it is extremely difficult to protect yourself. So I do online banking, right? But when you do it, you have to realize, oh, maybe some guy named Igor is also watching what I'm up to, and that's a risk we all have to take. Lewis says that you should change your passwords every month, but even doing that does not guarantee fraud protection. Scott, government investigators say they have now spoken to Hold Security and may launch their own investigation. Can't remember the passwords I already have. Jeff Pegues in our Washington bureau. Thank you, Jeff. Alzheimer's is one of the cruelest diseases, of course. There's no cure. So when a study came out today linking vitamin D deficiency to a higher risk of Alzheimer's and dementia, we wanted to know more. The study found that people who are moderately deficient in the so-called sunshine vitamin have a 53% greater risk of developing dementia. For those with a severe deficiency, the risk is more than double. Dr. John LaPook has been looking into this. And John, why a connection between vitamin D and Alzheimer's to begin with? Well, vitamin D controls a lot of cell functions. And uh, it's been found in the past that there are receptors to vitamin D throughout the body, almost everywhere, including in the memory centers of the brain. Now, initially, low vitamin D was linked to brittle bones. But in recent years, you've heard a lot of research about it being linked to other conditions like cancer, neurological problems, depression, and diabetes. Okay, so now the question everyone at home is shouting, should I take vitamin D supplements, and if so, how much? That's a tough one. Just because low vitamin D is linked to a condition doesn't mean that low vitamin D is causing it. So if your vitamin D level is very low, it's reasonable to try to get it up with, say, diet oily fish, getting out into the sun a little bit more, or supplementation. That may help prevent bone problems, but research has had a tough time showing that it helps prevent those other conditions that I mentioned. Now, I spoke to one of the authors of the paper, and he said he does not recommend giving people vitamin D as supplementation to help prevent dementia because it simply hasn't been shown to work. And we do know from other research that too much vitamin D is not great. It can cause kidney stones and a lot of other problems. And if you're deficient, a doctor can tell that with a blood test. Yes. John, thanks very much. There has to be a recognition that uh, Gaza cannot sustain itself permanently, closed off from the world. Uh, and incapable of providing some opportunity, jobs, 
economic growth for the population that lives there, particularly given how dense that population is, uh, uh, how young that population is. Uh, we're going to have to see a shift in uh, opportunity uh, for the people of Gaza. Uh, I have no sympathy for Hamas. Uh, I have great sympathy for ordinary people who are struggling uh, uh, within Gaza. Uh, and the question then becomes, can we find a formula in which Israel has greater assurance that Gaza will not be a launching pad for further attacks, perhaps more dangerous attacks as technology develops uh, into their uh, country? But at the same time, ordinary Palestinians have some prospects uh, for uh, an opening of Gaza so that they don't, do not feel walled off uh, and incapable of uh, pursuing uh, basic prosperity. Uh, I, I think there are formulas that are available, but they're going to require risks uh, on the, the part of uh, political leaders. They're going to require uh, a slow rebuilding of trust, which is obviously very difficult uh, in the aftermath of, of the kind of violence that we've seen. Uh, so I don't think we get there right away. Uh, but the U.S. goal right now would be to make sure that the ceasefire holds, uh, that Gaza can, be, uh, uh, can, can begin the process of rebuilding, uh, and that some measures are taken uh, so that uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the people of, uh, of Gaza feel some sense of hope. Our next story has a lot of people wondering, how could this happen? In an age of pat-downs and high-tech screening, a woman apparently got onto a jetliner Monday and flew from San Jose to Los Angeles with no ticket and no boarding pass. Tonight, she's being charged as a stowaway. Here's John Blackstone. At the airport in San Jose, California, 62-year-old Marilyn Hartman got through a TSA security checkpoint and then passed a Southwest Airlines gate agent. Rosemary Barnes is spokesperson for San Jose Airport. This was not a security breach. How can you say this isn't a security breach when someone gets through security without showing ID? There are a um, number of processes that the TSA can speak to in terms of the security screening process, but what's important here is that she was screened by the TSA for prohibited items before boarding the flight. We're told by a TSA source that video shows Hartman ducking behind a family and sneaking past a TSA officer checking documents. In a written statement, the TSA says the agency has initiated minor modifications to the layout of the document checking area to prevent another incident like this one. Boarding passes are checked two or usually three times. ID is checked at least once. How can this happen? That's a good question for TSA. That's a good question for Southwest Airlines. And we are working with those agencies to support them as, as they investigate what did occur so that they can prevent that from happening again. The San Jose airport was the focus of security concerns in April when a 15-year-old boy climbed an airport fence and stowed away in the wheel well of an airplane bound for Hawaii. He miraculously survived the high altitude and extreme low temperatures. The airport made security changes to its perimeter after that incident and is seeking money for more. Southwest Airlines says it's also investigating how Marilyn Hartman got on their flight yesterday. She's been arrested four times at San Francisco's airport, Scott, where she's described as a well-known plane hopper. John Blackstone reporting from the airport in San Jose. Thank you, John. Tonight in a poll, Americans are telling us what should be done with the surge of illegal immigrant children from Central America crossing the southern border. 43% told us that the children should be allowed to stay while awaiting a hearing on their immigration status. 50% said that the immigrants should be sent home without a hearing. In Texas, volunteers are helping to patrol the border. Manuel Bohorkas went there, never imagining what he would see. We spent a few hours with Reserve Deputy Gustavo Cobos as he tried to stop smugglers sneaking immigrants into Brooks County. Uh, dark colored Chevy. He was suspicious of this SUV. It's 
slowing down, we're slowing down, we got a possible bailout. The chase that followed is routine here. We got a bailout, got a bailout, got a bailout. It's, it's any MS, we got someone run over. And so are the risks taken by smugglers and immigrants. Out here, illegal immigration goes beyond politics. It's a matter of life and death. <laughs> Brooks County can only afford one deputy per shift to cover 900 square miles. So Kobos, who's an officer 80 miles away, volunteers his free time to help fill the gaps. We're all brothers. We're out there to help each other out. So that's but You're not getting paid for this. You don't even have health insurance in case you get hurt. You're taking a big risk. I am taking a big risk, but at the same time, the bigger risk is what happens to Brooks when all the funds are depleted, when there's no more manpower. That's the big risk. 16 other police officers from outside Brooks County have also volunteered and been deputized here. They try to intercept smugglers before they drop off their human cargo. The bodies of more than 400 immigrants who succumbed to the heat have been recovered in the Texas brush. This is the prime example right here. This is what you're trying to avoid. This is what we're trying to avoid. And Chief Deputy Benny Martinez carries the bodies in a pickup. This was the 45th body he recovered this year. She's breathing, that's a good thing. The woman Deputy Cobos helped survived. He'll be back on patrol tonight. They come over here and this is the closest they'll get to an American dream before they just pass out, take their last breath. That doesn't sound like an American dream. The woman who appeared to be pushed from the SUV is still in the hospital. Her only form of identification was a Mexican passport. Scott, the other people in the SUV, including the smuggler, all got away. The death toll in the Ebola outbreak in four West African nations, Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Nigeria, rose today to at least 932. To remind you, Ebola is spread not through the air, but through contact with bodily fluids, including sweat, saliva, and blood. Deborah Pata has more tonight on the battle to stop it. A top Liberian health official tells us that there may already be hundreds more fatalities than have been reported. And the outbreak is going to get worse. One of the epicenters of the disease is in Liberia's capital, Monrovia, where there are only two treatment centers. One of them only has 18 beds for Ebola victims. This means that many infected people are being left to die in their villages without any medical care. This man's body was dumped on the street. A 60-bed capacity treatment unit is now being constructed, but the health department says it is not enough. On the front line of the battle, many health workers have died. Officials say it's because they don't have proper protective gear or adequate training. But it is fear of the disease that is causing more harm than the disease itself. We go use sanitizer. Teams are now patrolling neighborhoods to educate the public on how the disease is spread. But many believe isolation wards are in effect a death sentence, causing people to hide sick relatives and bury their bodies in secret. What is different about this Ebola outbreak, Scott, is that it's the first time the disease has spread to urban areas, places like the capital of Liberia, Monrovia, home to over one million people, have been hardest hit, and trying to contain this virus in a densely packed city center is proving to be extremely complicated. Deborah Pata reporting from Johannesburg, South Africa. Thank you, Deborah. And late word in this country tonight, New York City health officials who say a man who arrived from West Africa with high fever and gastrointestinal symptoms is not infected with Ebola, as had been feared. A federal appeals court heard arguments today in lawsuits seeking to overturn same-sex marriage bans in Ohio, Kentucky, Michigan, and Tennessee. Since the Supreme Court struck down part of the Defense of Marriage Act last year, same-sex marriage advocates have won 20 straight times in federal court. Don Daler tells us lives are changing with every decision. How does one go about finding a ban on short notice? 
Sandy Ferlani and Christine Donato went from hoping they could get married someday we have to, put at the top of the list I know. to scrambling to make wedding arrangements. This has happened very quickly, hasn't it? Really quickly, yeah. I mean, you would think we would be better prepared, but... I know. We're now <laughs> running around like lunatics trying to get a plan in place. <laughs> Can you tell us what happened at school today? Ferlani and Donato have been together for 18 Nothing. years and have a six-year-old son, Henry. They were among 11 Pennsylvania couples whose lawsuit led to a landmark decision in that state, giving same-sex couples the right to marry. It sort of validates our family, like we are just as important as everybody else. Our son doesn't have to feel like a second-class citizen. You know, he has a, a legal family. He's protected. A majority, 55% of Americans of all ages, now back same-sex marriage, double the number 18 years ago. Nowhere is that groundswell more apparent than in the courts. More than 70 marriage equality cases challenging state bans on same-sex unions have been filed in 30 states. I think we are in a tipping point with respect to marriage rights for gay couples. Suzanne Goldberg of Columbia Law School believes it's inevitable one of those challenges will reach the Supreme Court. She says shifts in American attitudes could influence the justices, just as they have since the 1950s, with landmark rulings on racial equality and women's rights. The change in public opinion shapes the landscape in which the court will hear a case coming up about same-sex couples' right to marry. And while the justices on the court can do whatever they like, they are the Supreme Court after all, uh, the shift in the landscape will unquestionably shape the context for their opinion. Circle the right word. For Lonnie and Donato, hope there's a day in Henry's future when he's proud of what his parents helped accomplish. <laughs>
In total, 40 regions of the Russian Federation are receiving Ukrainian refugees and have introduced emergency situation plans as people keep fleeing from the violence and destruction in the southeast Ukraine. An emergency state has been declared in the Rostov, Volgograd, Astrakhan and Stavropol regions, in the Republic of Kalmykia and in the city of Sevastopol. The U.N. General Assembly has held a meeting on the desperate situation in the Gaza Strip after Israel's nearly month-long onslaught on the impoverished Palestinian territory. Here's more on that story. The U.N. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has, during a General Assembly meeting, called for the lifting of the years-long blockade of the Gaza Strip. He also urged both Israelis and Palestinians to sit for talks on an enduring truce. Do we have to continue like this, build, destroy, and build and destroy? We will build again, but this must be the last time to rebuild. This must stop now. They must go back to negotiate, negotiating table. Then the UN Special Coordinator for the Middle East, Robert Seri, took the podium via video link from Cairo. He told the assembly that solutions addressing the root causes of the Gaza war have been identified, but yet need to be implemented. Part of the fundamental issues that are the root of instability, underdevelopment and conflict in Gaza have already been identified in Security Council Resolution 1860 back in 2009, but they remain unimplemented. The basic equation is and the blockade on Gaza. Meanwhile, the Commissioner General of the UN Reliefs and Works Agency, UNRWA, Pierre Kreimble, warned the Assembly that even if a durable ceasefire is reached, Palestinians will be in dire need of assistance, as many of them will return to destroyed homes with no water or power. What are they going back to? Some will find their homes damaged, others completely destroyed. They will return to neighborhoods where there is no electricity because the Gaza power plant has been destroyed. For her part, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Navi Pillay, who also joined the meeting via video conference, blamed both the Israeli army and the Palestinian fighters for the current situation in the Gaza Strip. The hostilities, as we've heard, between Israel and Hamas and other armed groups in Gaza have raged now for almost a month causing immeasurable suffering and damage. Any attacks in violation of these principles on civilians, homes, schools and hospitals must be condemned and may amount to war crimes. The last UN official speaking about the Gaza situation was Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Deputy Emergency Relief Coordinator Kyung Wa Kang. She read out a report on the destruction of main infrastructures of the Gaza Strip. But preliminary reports reveal a situation of utter devastation, particularly in areas that Israel declared a no-go zone. Large parts of neighborhoods damaged or destroyed. UN staff on the ground report that the level of destruction to civilian infrastructure, private homes and land is much greater than in previous conflicts. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has defended Tel Aviv's month-long war in Gaza, which killed nearly 1,900 people, many of them children. I think it was justified. I think it was proportional. Uh, and that doesn't in any way take away from the deep regret for, we have for the loss of, uh, of a single civilian. We've gone to extraordinary lengths to avoid civilian casualties. Uh, Hamas has gone to extraordinary lengths to ensure that they have civilian casualties, as you've just seen. 
Netanyahu also thanked the U.S. for its support throughout the offensive against Gaza. He referred to the $225 million the U.S. recently gave Israel in aid to replenish ammunition used against Palestinians. Netanyahu's comments come as the U.N. has condemned Israel for deliberately targeting civilians in Gaza. The U.N. has said that Israel knew the world body schools in Gaza were housing civilians, but pounded them repeatedly. The pressure inside this room and the adjoining airlock is lower than that in the corridor. This means that the inside of the rooms will not move into the corridor and therefore not contaminate the air in the common areas. We believe that patients can survive if we look after them, rehydrate them, give them transfusions, prevent infections, replenish their hydroelectrolytic losses, stop vomiting and diarrhea. In that case, there are strong reasons for hope. swept away. Get those people out. Get out! Look out! Get out! Get out! Get out! Get out! Get out! Oh my God, that car is driving! Get out! Get out! The United Nations Children's Fund UNICEF says that Israel's latest war in Gaza has had a catastrophic and tragic impact on Palestinian children. The UN agency says that nearly 400,000 children in the besieged Gaza Strip are in immediate need of psychological help to overcome the trauma that they have experienced during the Israeli onslaught. UNICEF says that many children are suffering from trauma as they have seen their parents and friends die and have witnessed terrible amputations during the war. The international body says children risk facing communicable diseases over the lack of power and sanitation. Skin diseases have already been detected, as many Gazans have been left without clean water for weeks now. UNICEF has warned that such diseases can be fatal among children.